Greetings and salutations, imagination connoisseurs, and all you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community. Welcome here for a Saturday afternoon chat. I'm sorry I did not do a chat yesterday. I was planning on it, but as many of you know, I was finishing the, well, I wasn't finishing. We were actually ending the beginning of the color timing process for the feature film Tango Shalom, which I have been producing and I'm also the editor and post-production supervisor on. Yesterday, we were working with famed director of photography, Massimo Zeri. And luckily enough, he had a half day of time where we were able to time reels five and six with him. Do a first, what's called a, 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 sp a color spotting session. Where what we were doing during that time was... We look at the reel. The movie's broken into six reels. Each reel is 20 minutes or shorter. Normally, you broke movies into reels because you you had 20-minute, literally, reels <laughs> that would go to, the, go to the theater. They'd put them all up on a platter to cut them together. But in the digital world, you don't have to do that. However, the best way to do that through the post-production process is to keep that old methodology and finish the movie in reels. So it's broken into 20 minute or shorter reels. And that is easier for the sound design team led by Steve Yeaman to start work on the film. In addition to the color, the, the my colorist is working on our final reels to get them to look great. So how that process works is we go through each reel and we spot, we color spot, just like you sound, you do spotting with the sound uh, team, but we color spot the reels and we can set different looks for different scenes. And why we why reels five and six were so difficult is because during the production of what was an independent movie, there were many multiple resolutions of video capture used for the final two uh, reels of the film. So it was quite uh, quite a challenge. And when I started this process three years ago, for instance, we had red footage, we had Canon footage, we had black magic footage. And now uh, technology exists where we can increase the color space, uh, which was great. So I had to, uh, I had to transcode, retranscode footage I originally transcoded three years ago, and uh, open that up so we have more choices and more availability of the actual color space of the video available to us. And it was fantastic. I mean, the 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 la the, the dance sequence that ends the movie, and the entire dance competition that ends the movie. Yes, there's a dance competition. Uh, it, it all looks great. So that's where I was yesterday, and I just wanted you guys to know. That's why I didn't do a chat. I apologize. This is the 85th live observations chat. I cannot believe it. I'm back from CinemaCon. I'm a little exhausted. Uh, I recorded more episodes of our podcast, uh, Best Movie, Worst Movie, today with Olympic gold, gold medalist Cody Miller, who is in town. And, of course, John Campia. You'll be hearing those in the next coming weeks. The first of those shows will drop on Monday. For those of you who are Star Trek fans, today a new podcast of the Inglorious Trexperts dropped. And we were so proud to host Rafe Needleman, who at 13 years old wrote a Star Trek trivia book that was published by Pocket Books around the time, well, in 1980, in the wake of Star Trek The Motion Picture. We had been joking about Rafe Needleman on the show for a long time, and Rafe Needleman, who is now a tech journalist in the San Jose in the Bay Area, actually heard our podcast, and uh, he contacted us, and it was uh, he flew himself down from Northern California to be on our podcast, which was incredible. While I was at CinemaCon, I actually ran into producer Dean Devlin, who, of course, produced, well, created Stargate along with Roland Emmerich and Independence Day and Godzilla. He's a, He produces The Librarians. Just ran into him randomly at CinemaCon in Caesars Palace in Vegas. I got to go up to him and actually talk to him and thank him in person because I hadn't seen him since we started doing the Inglorious Trexperts podcast. That was a real thrill. So listen to today's. I mean, it might not make a lot of sense, but it sure is funny that Rafe Needleman was on our podcast. And uh, as a lot of you also know, this podcast is now sponsored by Lucky Tiger Men's Grooming Products. And let me tell you, okay, this has now become kind of a funny thing. I am so proud of you guys, the post-geek singularity community. I can't even, uh, it's, it's so funny. I have said on this podcast that I wanted to have, like I've never had a sponsor before. And 
I love Lucky Tiger products, but you know, I didn't I, I didn't know much about their entire product line. So when they agreed to sponsor me, I'm also gonna be doing work for them on their Club Lucky Tiger, which you can go see at clubluckytiger.com. I'm gonna be doing creating content for them and things like that. But they also really like what we're doing here on this podcast. But I didn't know much about them. And I have to say that first of all, I want to get Alan Murphy, the CEO of Lucky Tiger, on this podcast, hopefully for the 100th episode. And I had suggested that you go to getluckytiger.com where you can buy their fabulous products, or you could go to the uh, the website clubluckytiger.com. And I, I was telling everybody to write him and tell him that he should come on to the podcast. Well, apparently... He, he, or come on to this, this, the, the Rob observations, the live show. I wanted to add, ask questions and ask why he decided to sponsor this channel and me. And apparently I told you guys to write him and you have been, not only have you been writing Alan Murphy, the CEO of lucky tiger, but he's been writing back to some of you. <laughs> and I think at first he was a little taken aback by, by, <laughs> by this. I can't thank you all enough. It's pretty funny. I mean, in terms of marketing a product, I didn't think that I never thought of myself as marketing a product. Uh, I just thought it was cool that they're sponsoring me, but I actually love their product. And here's another thing. Now, yes, this is going to be, I I admit this, this is a shameless commercial. So I'm going to show you this. This is, this is their facial scrub. This is the lucky tiger facial scrub. I, I love this lucky tiger facial scrub because, you know, I don't have a beard and mustache, so I can't use a lot of their products, but I love this facial scrub. I thought that would be like the ultimate in lucky tiger products. Boy, was I wrong. So they sent me a box of their stuff, you know, to try out because I'm not going to sit here and pimp some product if I don't like it. I mean, I would never do that. All right. So I got to show you something. I got to show you something. So this Lucky Tiger Suds and Studs. Can you see that? Suds and Studs. I didn't really even know what this was. You know, I, I was opening a box like a kid on Christmas morning. I had no idea what this was. It is, of course, Gentleman's Bar Soap, right? Not very exciting. Okay, it wasn't very exciting until I opened this box. Open this container. So it's it's it's. By the way, the soap is not in here. I'll tell you right now. Okay, this is peppermint soap. Now, normally I'm a vanilla soap guy. I like my, you know, vanilla body wash wherever you get it. That's what I usually like to use. That's my product of choice. So I open this box. Right. It it had this this peppermint smell, and you know what it smelled like? It smelled like those awesome like peppermint hard candies where the the red part of the peppermint candy is like clear and the white part of the candy is like really glossy, really good hard candies, like old fashioned hard candies. That's what this soap smelled like. I couldn't get in the shower fast enough to try it and I couldn't get out of the shower. Uh, I just didn't want to leave. I was sudsing myself up with this Lucky Tiger suds. and It was was so good. I, I, I mean, I just loved it. I mean, if you love peppermint, it was so good. I felt like I was turning into a piece of peppermint candy that, you know, wanted to be eaten, if you know what I'm saying. But anyway, so it was funny because I've often thought about the fact that if the zombie apocalypse happened, right, there would be two places that I would want to go first. One would be the local National Guard armory. You know, you got to you got to gun up. Got to get I got to get munitions. I got to get weapons, whatever I can. Perhaps an armored vehicle would be nice. If I could hotwire it or something, I would go to the National Guard Armory and then I would go to the local supermarket and get as many canned goods that were still remaining. That's where I thought I, I thought if the zombie apocalypse came, I'd be sorted, right? I'm adding a third place to go because when you're fighting the undead and you get the muck and the disgusting blood and gore from from zombies all over you, this is what I want in my life. I want suds and studs from Lucky Tiger. Uh, to adorn my body for a long period of time. So how's that for a commercial, Alan Murphy? How is that for a commercial? Lucky Tiger, when you survive the zombie apocalypse and all you want to do is wipe the dead off. Suds and studs, man, right there, I got to tell you. Thank you, sir. Anyway, uh, I did see Shazam, which I'm going to talk about probably later. Um, I have a lot of things to say about it. I did not love Shazam. I will say I did not love Shazam. It did not... (laughs) <laughs> there was not enough verisimilitude in it for me, <laughs> to be honest. But anyway, um, there's a few letters. I'm, again, everybody, the, the letters just keep coming fast and furious. And uh, please, if you have, people are now sending me pictures. Somebody, 
sent me a, a reader sent me. I'm going to put them up on the. We're starting a gallery page on the burnettwork.net. If you want to send me something, that's the best place. Go to my website, the burnettwork.net. Send me pictures. Send me your stories. Send me your heartfelt misses. I mean, it's incredible. I, I I must have the best letters of anybody on YouTube, and I can't thank you enough. Uh, I keep getting them, and they are incredible. There's three in particular that I wanted to read today uh, from the members here. As you know, I love reading these letters now. They become a big part of the show. This one comes from Stubble McShave, who is in Sweden. And I'm a big fan of Stubbles. He's he's a big supporter of this channel. He's also on the John Campia channel. So I, I just like this letter. So Stubble writes, <clears throat> Hi, Rob. I was one day old when Star Wars A New Hope was released in the U.S. We didn't get it here in Sweden until half a year later. Although, since I wasn't even one years old, it didn't affect me that much. I missed seeing all the Star Wars films in the movie theater. I got to see them at my best friend's house on VHS. Now, I don't condone criminal behavior, but there wasn't any way to buy the Star Wars movies on VHS. You had to rent them, and like everyone else, we copied a lot of VHS rental movies. So did I, Stubble. So did I. I remember when my friends just had acquired Return of the Jedi. We would sit inside and watch it four times in a row. We were too young to get interested in the characters. We watched it because of the big battles and the funny lines. Later in life, it's the interesting characters that have kept the interest up for the movies. Anyway, I consumed almost all films via my friend's illegal duplication of rented movies. The exception was when we had video marathon weekends. We went to a small, shady version of the Blockbuster where you could rent 10 movies for a low cost and keep them for a week. The marathon would start in the evening at 5 p.m. and last until noon the next day. The movies we rented at this shady Blockbuster-type place were not of the highest quality. <laughs> I would be surprised if more than two or three of the batch of 10 had a theatrical release. It was during this period I saw the Critters movies and stuff like that. After the marathon, my friend and his brother discussed which movies that we had rented that would join their collection of ill-gotten movies. They would usually pass on most of them. I know that I struggled through some of those movies and probably didn't enjoy watching more than half of them, but I look back on those times with a certain fondness and realize that I got to see a lot of cult B movies that I never would have seen if we hadn't, if, if we hadn't been so cheap or thrifty. Anyway, I just wanted to say that my childhood was in large part shaped by that cumbersome machine that would often eat the tape of the VHS cassettes, and though it was, cumbers it was a cumbersome beast, I still have fond memories of it. But I'm glad that we live in different times now where we can buy our movies and don't have to rewind the tape before returning it. Take care and bring the awesome. Sincerely, Stubble. Stubble, I love this letter because as many people know, uh, re recently right after my 13th birthday, I lived in Seattle, Washington, and video stores were new. There were very few of them in the United States at all. There was one called, I believe it was called Video Station, which was one of the first video stores that was here in LA. And it was really, it was all started by Andre Blay, who was really the godfather of the home video movement. Now, Andre Blay was one of my great heroes who recently passed away. And I'm really upset about this because I, I'd often thought about doing home. I really want to do a documentary about the history of home video since I basically lived it. And he started, a, he was the, Andre Blay was the first person, he actually went to 20th Century Fox and he proposed that he would license 50 Fox movies to put on pre-recorded video cassette. And the studio's like, why, why would you want to do that? And he thought, well, I, I you know, I think there's going to be this emerging market of people that as video technology started to proliferate into people's homes that people would might want to rent movies. And he started, I think it was called the Video Club of America or something. And he was the first person to basically put movies out on pre-recorded cassette, and he licensed Fox titles. He eventually, by 1981, was president of 20th Century Fox Home Video uh, because he owned their movies, and they had to buy them back from him, uh, and he made millions <laughs> off of them. So the home video era, I too, Stubble, I was a video pirate. My friend Mike Schertz and I, we would rent movies. I started working in video stores. I wouldn't have to pay for them. I'd bring home movies, and I... I would daisy chain VCRs together, and my VCR, I had an RCA VFT 6, well, 625 and then 650, the big piano key. The 650 wasn't, but the 625 of the piano key buttons, it would defeat early versions of Macrovision. It was a great player. I, I, I dearly loved it. I 
I copied thousands of movies. Now I will cop to this. I did one thing. I'm going to admit this right now. Uh, I committed, well, I committed certain crimes when, when it comes to home video, but I did once copy a movie and I, I unscrewed, <laughs> I unscrewed the tape. It was silent running. I unscrewed the pre-recorded the original tape. I had copied it onto another VHS and I, I switched them. I switched the, I only did that once, but you'll notice that, that video stores used to start putting, if you remember this, really thick metal stickers, like these silver metallic stickers on. So you couldn't do that anymore. You could tell if somebody had used a razor blade and cut through it. I only did it once. I felt guilty about it. But by 1985, I started, I, I was completely out of VHS tapes and I was into Laserdisc in a big way because Laserdisc, one of the initial test markets in 1978, yes, 1978, was Seattle, Washington. So... I uh, I was a video pirate too, and I copied thousands of movies on tape. But then I got rid of them when I went to college at the Evergreen State College. I brought all of my videotapes, and I basically left them in the fifth floor of a dorm to be consumed by whoever wanted them. And uh, so for five years, it was a glorious time. So Stubble, I feel you. I thought that was fantastic, uh, amazing. Now once again, here is a letter from the great Norman Lau, who I, by the way, I have him obsessed with the Jerry Anderson show UFO. He always writes me really great letters that are very thought-provoking and interesting, so I thought I would share one here, another one. I love sharing Norman's letters. Uh, his letter starts out, Superhero versus Super Hype. I thought this was appropriate for this weekend because we have yet another comic book movie opening, and it's doing quite well. Good morning, Rob. Here is a discussion that I just had recently regarding my attitude and feelings towards superhero movies. My coworker and fellow member of the post-geek singularity asked me a few questions in the whole of our conversation, such as, why haven't you seen Captain Marvel yet? Do you have a problem with Captain Marvel? Do you not like seeing a female-led superhero role? Why don't you go to any of the superhero movies anymore? All good questions. My answers. One, because I don't have a lot of free time to go see movies in general anymore, nor do I really care to. Two, I don't think about Captain Marvel really either way, good or bad. She's never really been on my radar, unless you mean Captain Marvel as Shazam, who is my Captain Marvel. Three, I have absolutely no problem with female-led superheroes. I saw Wonder Woman in the theater three times. Keep that in context to what I said about me actively going to the movies today. But the last question is the one that I was the most blunt with, most honest with. Why don't you go to the superhero movies anymore? My answer, aside from the grand spectacle that Marvel and DC have made their heroes, what do heroes stand for anymore? And I, personal belie I personally believe that the oversaturation of the superhero genre has become one of the greatest marketing hype machines of modern pop culture. I completely understand why. These movies make a ton of money. But is that where these movies, but that is where these movies have lost me. And to some degree, a certain percentage of fans who still believe in the traditional aspects of what a superhero means. In 1978, Richard Donner's Superman the movie set the standard for everything that a superhero and a superhero film stood for the heroic ideal, the highest of standards. When I was younger, the ideal of the superhero meant everything to me more so than what leapt off from the printed page or the spectacle of a movie or TV screen. The ideal was the seed that was planted in me at a very young age and the complexity within that ideal that a superhero had to be morally just, compassionate, willing to sacrifice for the greater good, and above all, act upon what is right, was the very foundation of why superheroes existed in the first place. Because being able to achieve the paragon level of a superhero was always out of reach, yet so incredibly worth the personal pursuit of that goal. Now, gen generationally, for me, it was for truth, justice, and the American way, as the late and legendary Christopher Reeve so poignantly and effort effortlessly stated as Superman in the 1978 feature film. As times changed since Superman the movie, four decades in fact, I understand why the evolution of superheroes had to change, but I still think, 
as so perfectly presented by Joe Johnston or the Russo brothers in Captain America, the first Avengers, the first Avenger and sub subsequently in the Winter Soldier respectively, sorry about that, the heroic ideal, the heart of a hero is still very relevant and very important to how heroes are and should be perceived today as that connective thread to our own inner heroic ideal that is inspired when we see acts of heroism, leadership, and self-sacrifice upon that larger-than-life life portrayal on the silver screen. When scrawny Steve Rogers stood up to the bully with his trademark defiance of, I can do this all day, or when the 98-pound weakling that he was threw himself on a grenade to save his friends in training, that showed the heart that Dr. Erskine was looking for, the heart of a good man a hero in the making. Now, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and say I won't enjoy Avengers Endgame because I totally will for the spectacle and excitement of it. And I hope that somewhere in the story, I will see truly heroic and inspirational moments. I'm looking at you, Captain America. So that is something worth anticipating. I know I'm probably a small island about this, but I look forward to the day when that pendulum begins to swing back to focusing on the heroic ideal again. And my hopes are that Zachary Levi will be able to do that for me with Shazam. Thanks, Rob, for enter entertaining my thoughts for the day. Norman Lau. Again, uh, I find this to be a fantastic letter. It's exactly the kind of thing I like um, for you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity, to share with me. I have to tell you, though, I, I don't know. Normally, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Norman Lau is saying. But I, I, I feel that we haven't lost the heroic ideal. I, I, I think especially in the MCU, these characters are trying to do the right thing. They aren't necessarily morally compromised. I mean, for the most part, we're seeing heroes that are, they are the, the people, they espouse the, the beliefs and they, they act like those people that I would want to emulate if I was a superhero. Certainly Captain America does. And listen, the fact that they lost in Infinity War, and make no mistake, the heroes did lose. Uh, half half the universe was lost. I can't. I don't think anyone suffered a bigger loss than the Avengers did in the last uh, in Avengers Infinity War. And I think in Endgame, even after suffering that kind of a defeat, they're not willing to give up. They're they're continuing on to try and triumph uh, in the end and set things right. I don't know. What do you guys think about Norman's letter? I, I hope this brings on some, some heartfelt discussion and some real introspection here because you guys never let me down. It's amazing to read the comments here in these live chats and the comments that are left on the, the, the actual videos that are left here. But um, uh, great, really compelling stuff. Thank you, Norman, for sending that in. And for anybody who wants to send in letters, please keep sending them to me at thebrunetwork.net. But now here's the one. Here's the one that really got me thinking because it's something I've been thinking about for a very long time, and it is the topic of today's chat. This comes from Dave Ortiz. Hey, Rob, I have been an avid fan of yours ever since your Collider days, and I always appreciate your perspective on all things geek. Your chats are refreshing, and while I rarely have the opportunity to catch you live, I make it a point to watch them at some point during the day. I was wondering where you stand on the age-old debate of art versus artist. When I was younger, I had no issue separating the two, and I would scoff at those who had a hard time with it. However, as I've gotten older, I'm into my 40s now, I find myself starting to feel differently, specifically in regards to those accused of or found guilty of sexual misconduct. While I'm not a victim of sexual abuse, over the years I have learned of family members who were and have also become friends with many who were victims. I suppose this has made me more sensitive when I hear of famous people who are accused of these awful acts. For example, I have no desire to see any Woody Allen, Roman Polanski, or even Brian Singer directed films anymore, nor will I choose to listen to Michael Jackson's music after watching Finding Neverland. I know that we should view others as innocent until proven guilty. But as someone who has seen how victims of sexual abuse can truly suffer for the rest of their lives, I just can't bring myself to look the other way, as it were, when such heinous accusations are lobbed or, or lobbied against famous artists. I must admit, when I hear you mention your friendship with Brian Singer on these chats, I sometimes cringe. 
I can't help but wonder how those who have been victims of sexual abuse in the post-geek singularity community feel about it too. Anyway, I hope you choose to discuss this a bit, as I think it's become quite prevalent a prevalent issue in the entertainment industry today. Keep up the good work, Dave. Well, isn't this just a minefield? Um, you know, it, it really got me thinking. And while I'm not going to uh, address personal uh, my personal feelings about people that I know, uh, nor will I talk about um, any allegations leveled at people. Because, again, we still live in a society, I do believe that we live in a society um, uh, uh, innocent until proven guilty. I mean, that is the basis of our legal system. I don't I don't like the rush to judgment that we have in the Twitter sphere and, and the online uh, verse that, uh, you know, a person's career could be ruined in a day. I Hell, my, my YouTube channel could be ruined just by even addressing this subject if somebody doesn't appreciate my response. But so I'm not going to I'm not going to address individual people or or those kinds of things. However, the idea of separating art from the artist is a good one, and I and I do think that it's um, always relevant to talk about. But first, when it comes to the the you talked about sexual abuse, and I, I will mention quickly that I was involved in a situation when I was 16 years old where someone came to me for help and it was a horrific experience for them. And I learned firsthand how horrible that abuse can be. Um, it was, I was out of the realm of my experience and I frankly couldn't believe it. And it, it was shocking to say the least. Uh, and I completely sympathize with victims and uh, it's, I can't imagine because, you know, you're 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 stealing a part of someone's soul when you're doing that. It's it's a truly it's a truly evil uh, inclination. I I do believe when when you are are you're foisting your own you're you're putting your own selfish desires before the rights and and sanctity of the individual uh, of another individual and and uh, both their rights and their 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 rights as a human being and their ability to live the way they want. And frequently, it's people that can't defend themselves the way they should. So I understand how heinous it can be. But that brings us back to the question of the art versus the artist. There have been, well, the history of mankind has not been one of, of moonbeams and rainbows. It has been an ongoing cosmic charnel house as our, as our planet spins around the universe. I mean, even my beloved 2001 A Space Odyssey, what is the first thing that human beings or proto-humans do when they're in, they they get enlightened, even if it's enlightenment through the, the monolith? They choose to pick up weapons and beat the shit or kill their fellow human beings simply to get the watering hole back. I mean, we don't have a great record of doing good things to one another. However, I do think, I do think that somebody because human beings are infinitely creative, I also think that human beings are very compartmentalized about their behavior. And, you know, I have even found myself fairly recently in a situation where I lost control. I got incredibly angry about something and, and, uh, was not proud of, of even me. I lost control. It was, it was for a brief moment. Was there an excuse? No, I should not have lost control, but, it was a brief moment. It's it was something that was atypical for me. I'm not looking for absolution or anybody. It was wrong. I'll flat out just say it was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. However, as a human being, sometimes these kinds of things happen, or sometimes we are people that are consumed by uh impulses that are sometimes beyond our control and our uh our, our complex. That's why, for instance, even if you commit murder. We have different degrees of it in our courts of law. There's, of course, uh, involuntary manslaughter all the way up to first degree murder. And, uh, you know, I think if you uh, if you plot to murder somebody and you, you've thought about it for a long time, you create a plan and you carry it out, that's a very different act than if you accidentally or something happens and you cause the death of another individual. There's There's different degrees there. And I think that's something our legal system recognizes, and I think that's that's part of 
what we need as human beings to take into consideration when people do things. And I am not necessarily one to make those, 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 those kinds of, of judgments are above my pay grade. Uh, I would hope that people, when they do these kinds of things are brought up uh, in front of a jury of their peers and are properly judged by the laws of the land. I, I believe that wholeheartedly. I believe that as an American, and I think it's very, very important. And for everybody that says, well, what about miscarriages of justice? What about all those people that are on death row that shouldn't be there? They shouldn't be there, and it's an imperfect system, but it's 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 the system that we have. And when I think back to the Salem witch trials, for instance, where, where innocent people were pilloried by the community or even burned at the stake, uh, things like that, it's a tough call. But, you know, when I was not angry, I'm working on films or I'm, I'm working on videos or I'm talking to you on the internet or things like that, I would hope that right now what I'm trying to, the values that I'm trying to espouse, the, the community that I'm trying to build here with you, the post-geek singularity community, has value. And, and I'm trying my best as a, as, a, as a deeply flawed human being to bring positivity and, and share my enthusiasm for everything that I like and, and I think my thoughtful nature in exploring these questions to all of you. So it, 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 if nothing else, I'm creating a forum where people can share these ideas. And that to me is, is what I'm all about as a person. That's what I've enjoyed. And I've, I've talked a lot about looking at, at both sides of a story. And, and I, I do believe in, in the idea of right and wrong. And I don't think all ideas are good. I don't think all ideas should be given equal time. But in our society, those ideas, those bad ideas will eventually get weeded out, I think. I mean, but what's important is you have to have discourse. You have to have people <clears throat> that can talk respectably, respectively or respectably. They, you, have to be, you have to be respectful of your, your fellow human being. Uh, even if they come at you from a, a, an entirely different viewpoint. I also kind of feel that way about art. Uh, first of all, the idea to even create art is, is sort of uniquely human. It's a representation of our imagination, our ability to see the world, our consciousness, really, our self-awareness, our ability to dream. Now, I the, on my day could start out and I could spend hours and hours and hours creating work. And I could have been creating it for, in the case of Tanger Shalom, working on a film for, for three years. Now, nothing that I've done on that movie has any, uh, has any bearing on what might happen tonight later. I might find myself in a situation where I go out to pick up a pizza or I go to the grocery store and I wind up in an altercation in 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 the uh, in the uh, parking lot at the local I don't know Vons, and uh, a gun is brandished and I might it won't even be my gun necessarily the gun might go off and somebody that I was in an altercation with might wind up dead. Then suddenly I'm thrust into the spotlight, the legal system, uh, the gears begin turning, and a lot of my life could change. Other another person's life has been lost, and. I would hope that I would be judged fairly and and yet depending on what happens everything that I've said up to that point in my life might be called into question for a situation that happened that I don't even know is going to happen 5 hours from now or whenever now there are people in the world that truly are evil people they do evil bad things and there is a methodology behind what they do. They exploit other people. It, it's the same thing as involuntary manslaughter and uh, a premeditated first degree murder. Now, I don't think all art can be separated from the artist, but I do think, I'll put it in geek terms, for instance, once art has been created and it's existed in the, in the universe, I don't think it necessarily belongs to the artist anymore. I think it joins the continuum of human endeavor. It goes out into the world. Now, whether, whether we look upon that art the same way after a person, uh, an artist's true nature is revealed or they have done something that is deemed monstrous, I mean, I think it, monstrous acts are self-evident. But if we deem it monstrous, our society, the legal system, how, whatever, whatever 
you you call it. Once that is deemed what it is, and once once the artist has been revealed to be whatever they're revealed to be, does that mean that their art suddenly becomes invalidated? That is a question that I've literally grappled with my whole life because I found out lots of horrible things about people that I really, really have admired. And it's it's a really, really tough question. And in my own life, for instance, uh, I, I have found that I watch movies, like, think about it. When we watch our, our films, when we watch the movies that we love the most, I'm thinking about the characters in those films. I'm thinking about the actors that brought them to life. I'm thinking about all the technicians that worked on, the, on those movies. But the stories themselves, that if they have truth in them, and if you like those characters, and if you like what's being told, does that movie, is that movie irre- irrevocably tied to the person that made it? If you enjoy a film, does that does that enjoyment get taken away when the person who made it gets revealed to be a monster? I, you know, <clears throat> when it comes right down to it, my answer to you is I just don't know. I really don't know. I and I don't know. I don't know whether we should know, to be honest. I think it's a question that we need to constantly debate because in this day and age, in our world now, we when somebody has transgressed, we're putting everybody, I think, into the same garbage heap, you know, and there is no degree. Uh, if somebody kisses somebody on the back of the head, now it can be called, this was unwanted touching and it goes off. I, I don't think that's the same as as human traffickers. And I don't think that's the same. I mean, sure. Is it a violation of people's personal space and their sovereignty as an individual? Absolutely. Uh, if it was unwanted, of course it is, but it's, it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult thing to say that when a film or a piece of artwork, or whether it's a music, music, whether it's painting, whether it's, I don't know, a concert, I, I, I just because Wagner's music was adopted by the Third Reich and maybe may as as basically their national anthem. Does that mean that the music doesn't the doesn't the music still work? Does doesn't that artwork still exist in the world? I mean, somehow it was able to to be created. Just like I think, if a human being is birthed by horrible parents, that human being exists on their own terms. Um, they have to. They have to. They're, they, they, you can't judge a human being by the acts of other human beings that aren't them ultimately, unless of course they display uh, behavior that their 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 parents displayed. Uh, but again, it's a tough question, and I, and I keep wrestling and grappling with this issue. But I I find myself leaning more toward the fact that if the art itself has basic human truths in it, no matter where it came from, just like a human being, uh, an offspring of truly horrible people can somehow grow up and maybe save the world. And I think it would be a terrible, terrible tragedy if someone was judged by their by their forefathers. Every 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 new person should be judged. And 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 again, there might be people in 50 or 100 years who don't know anything about the people that made the movie they discovered and watched. And if that movie touched them in some way, shape, or form, if they were moved by the characters, they were moved by the story, and that story inspired that person to do something good, if the art, I don't know, added something to the tapestry of the world, should the art itself be diminished or should we get rid of it because the person who made it? I don't know. It's a really difficult question to answer. My inclination is to say no. Is to say no. I, 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 because there's so many, especially in the case of movies, there's so many other hundreds, if not thousands of people that are, it's the collective efforts of so many. But again, it's a tough call. And I, I, I don't know the answer. And I don't think the answer maybe should ever be known. I think it's a debate that we need to constantly be having because we as a society, I once heard something when I was a little kid. I don't know if it was a parent who told me this or it was a teacher who said, you know what? 
you never really should think you know something. Never just never think you know everything about something. Because if you think you know everything about something, you won't stop you'll 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 stop exploring whatever that topic is. You'll stop thinking about it. And the thing that I think is most important, especially in this day and age where there's there's hair trigger outrage and there's acrimony on, on all sides of the aisle. We've forgotten that we're all human beings that are locked in this closed system on the planet Earth. We only have each other. That's it. There's no there's nobody else here except us. And you know, I read a statistic. I was talking to my uh, Lyft driver today, and I wanted to go back up and, and find out. We were talking about traveling and how how vital it is to travel and how. How Los Angeles, I think, is is a cosmopolitan city, and I, I enjoy the many different kinds of people that live here. And I, he said he traveled a lot too. And I said I once read a statistic that uh, 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 not a majority not a majority of Americans have a passport. So I Googled it. How many Americans have passports? Thirty six percent. Two thousand sixteen, the State Department said that thirty six percent of Americans have passports, and that to me is shocking. I mean, I've learned I've learned more about the world and more about my perspective on the world by traveling than by anything else. And to think that we only have 36% of our population now that have active passports, well, I'm like, that's this country would do well if more people would travel. And and I know then people, well, Rob, traveling is luxury, it's really expensive. Yeah, it is. Traveling is expensive, but it's also necessary. I think that there's nothing that cures. Uh, anyone of of racism or cures people of prejudice more than traveling around the world and meeting people different than you are. I mean, look, I'd never experienced, I I was telling somebody else the other day, when I went to South Korea last year, I loved South Korea. I loved, I was in Seoul, I was uh, drove through countryside, I went to the Olympics and I really enjoyed South Korea, lovely people, lovely food, beautiful, beautiful Seoul's beautiful city. But I really felt for the first time, I'm like, I'm like, I'm the only white dude here. Yeah, I was at a pretty cosmopolitan international hotel, but when I started walking around Seoul and when we traveled through the rest of the country, aside from being close to the military bases, it, it I understood what it was like. I'd walk into a store, people would look at me. You know, who's that? Who's that dude? <laughs> you know, who's that guy who's non-Korean? What's he, what's he here for? I mean, it was really, you were very acutely aware uh, there's no sign. I mean, no, that's not true. There's some English because there's a lot of American military personnel there. But it was I was I was an alien. I was truly an alien. And most of the places I'd traveled to, I mean, I've gone to even when you go to places like France or Germany, you still you're still in the Western world and you're acutely aware of that. I mean, I've I've lived in New Zealand. I've lived in Australia. I lived in Bulgaria, which was a former Soviet satellite state. And you know, you meet you meet people of all different different walks of life, but really you realize that everybody just wants the same thing. They want to be able to take care of themselves. They want to be able to take care of their family. They want to pursue their dreams. They want to be able to keep a roof over their heads, feed themselves, take care of of, of their loved ones. It's all the same all the way around the world. And our, our, our differences, the petty differences that we have, I mean, they, they they really are, are are immaterial in the grand scheme of things. And that's, that's one thing when you learn around uh, traveling around. But Again, people are complex. Human beings are, are difficult creatures to understand. We're all crazy and, and weird, and we do weird things. And I, I, I'd like to believe that when art is created, it develops a life unto itself. Um, I used to hate it. Like, I went to the Evergreen State College before I moved to USC. I used to hate it when people would call themselves artists. It used to really bother me. I'd say, what What do you do? Do you dance? Do you paint? Do you sculpt? You're a filmmaker. Why are you call calling yourself an artist presupposes that you're trying to say something. You know, I, I always thought that was sort of pretty egomaniacal to call yourself an artist. I hope that as a filmmaker, my work is deemed artistic by those who watch it, by the audience, by the public, by history. You know, I mean, it isn't for me to say whether I'm an artist. I understand when people call themselves artists. I really do. But I do think that that true art is only considered art when somebody else imbues it with meaning. And and I think that even if the most horrible person in the world created something beautiful, that beauty should be at least 
acknowledged. Um, and something good came out of that horrible person. That's kind of the way, I guess that's my glass is half full way of, of describing things. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, um, if that's right or wrong, but that's what I tend to believe. You know, the act of creation for whatever reason. Now I'm not saying that if you're like James gum in silence of the lambs or who, who's building a, a suit, a female suit, that is not. That is that is not art that I would ever approve of. That is because once again, it's it's violating the sovereign rights of another human being, which is something that 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 I abhor, uh, and it's it's something that I think is the worst thing that you can do to harm another human being, to harm their physical person, but more importantly, to harm their human spirit. And um, I think that that's that's it's, it's not something I'll ever support. But it's an interesting question, and I and I don't. I don't know the entire answer to all of those things. I really, I really don't. It's a tough one. So, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm conflicted. I'm actually, I'm very conflicted about it. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, I don't have an answer and it's funny, but I, it made me think I got this letter and I'm like, what do I think about that? I mean, what, <clears throat> what is it? that I want to believe. I mean, do I believe these things? And, and, and I think I'll probably be grappling with this issue for the rest of my life. Uh, I don't know because it is, it is, it is a tough one. It is a really difficult, uh, it's a difficult, 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 uh, thing to, to really sort of experience. And I, I don't know. It's, it's tough. It is tough. So, what do you guys think? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm. Again, I'm constantly, I'm constantly grappling with these issues. So I, I don't know the answer. I really don't know the answer. So I'm gonna go up and see what you guys, uh, what you guys have to say. <laughs> Brian Eng says, "Man, this is the longest letter reaction." <laughs> He's talking about life, says Mugen 8 Um. The game belt says, same with Ant-Man. Dan V900 says, Koba, no, it doesn't. Homecoming didn't get schools right either, where a teacher wouldn't go on for a six-hour drive on a regular school bus. That would be terrible, and the decathlon wouldn't have two dates. <laughs> um, I know you guys sent me some super chats, and they have seemed to have disappeared on me. And uh, I don't know why. I'm looking for your... Somebody sent a very generous super chat, and I'm looking for them, and they... They, uh, they're not here all of a sudden. I don't know why. I'll keep going. If you sent me one, just remind me. Taylor M says, as a rape survivor, thank you for discussing the trauma changes a person goes through. I think due process must happen though, in spite of my own experience. Well, listen, I'm, I'm very sorry that you experienced that. And let me tell you from what I had to deal with, it, it it's, it was horrific. I mean, I can't explain. I, having not suffered myself, but only dealt with the aftermath. It is, uh, I, I can't even, I, I don't know. I mean, I understand that human beings are gripped with urges they can't control, but the kind of things that people do to one another um, never, never cease to, the horrors that we visit upon one another, the world's hard enough already. And um, yeah, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know. It's rough. Let's see. Uh, Just Plain Steve asks, Crixus Maximus, how can you retcon the introduction of a character? That was her first movie. <laughs> That's true. I mean, you know, it's funny. Uh, when when um, Norman was talking about this, I mean, I do think that these, it, it, yes, the superhero movies have become money-making machines. But to me, like especially with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, so much time and effort is put into making these films that I find them to be joyous experiences. And for the most part, because they're based on superheroes and previously existing properties, um, you know, I, I like them. I think they do. They are uplifting and they do support the idea that we are still fighting for truth, justice, the American way, the human way nowadays. There's, there's more and more, there's more human beings around and it's, uh, it's, I find it, I find superhero movies still uplifting, but I understand what Norman's saying. I mean, you forget, look, it's hard to, to get past the hype. There is a hype machine. I'm, I've hyped myself beyond belief for Avengers Endgame. I can't wait. It's amazing. Um, but I, I, I honestly, I cannot 
wait to see this movie. And I think, look, the Avengers are trying to reverse the greatest crime that's ever been perpetrated on on gentle beings in the history of of the universe. Can they reverse it? I don't know, but I'm I'm certainly stoked that they're going to try. They could have just given up, you know. I mean, that would have been not a good thing. I would not I, I would not have liked to have seen that. But um, you know, who knows? It's really it's really hard to to say. Now, uh, somebody did send me a, a, a nice super chat and I didn't, it, it has disappeared because I'm the way I'm working now. I can't, I can't get to the super chats now. They, they, they only stay on for a certain amount of time and I don't know why they disappeared. I guess I talked too long. So just send it to me, send a star or something and, and I'll, I'll answer it because I really appreciate it. That's how this channel gets supported and I don't want to miss a question. Um, Google, Google says, make America gay again. Come on, man. Um, but you know what? To be honest, uh, I've had gay friends since I was 13, and making America gay again would probably make America inquisitive and funny, and uh, we'd have much better parties, and people would dress better. That's all I have to say about that. That could be cliche. Um, oh, Doshi asks, thoughts that J.J. might retcon The Last Jedi? Um, it's interesting. The Last Jedi... I, I don't know if he's going to retcon it. I mean, how can you retcon The Last Jedi? I mean, I know he said he didn't care if, or he said that would be okay with him. Uh, I don't know. But um, Mark C., but what'd you say, Mark? That was 20 bucks. I didn't, Mark, I know it disappeared. Say it again. What, what'd you say to me? And uh, I appreciate, Mark, you've been very generous with this channel. So tell me, type it again, sir. What did you say? What was your, you don't have to super chat it. Just send it to me. I know it was you. I know it was you, Mark. It's like, I know it was you, Fredo. Just write it and I'll answer because you always have really interesting questions. So uh, <laughs> if it was you, you could just be saying that. But um, uh, but please write it at the bottom. Do it. Do it. Do it now. Um, uh, <laughs> I love talk, says Dale M. Hey, man, you're here. I love you guys. I'm here talking to you. I'm only here because you you guys talk back to me. Um. Oh, Jennifer Jones. Ben Bamboo says, Jennifer Jones, hey, Jen, when you booted last time, all of your messages were redacted and you disappeared when there was a new mod. Okay, I'm going to apologize profusely to Miss Jennifer Jones. That was an accident. Uh, I didn't do that, just so you know. Um, I, I apologize profusely for that happening. I, I take full responsibility. That was an accident. I did not mean to block you or redact anything you said. I've loved your participation here. So please uh, blame me. Don't blame Canada, like you know people say. But um, I, uh, uh, I'm very sorry for that. That was that was me. Um, uh, oh, Rob said Mark C sent you a super chat about the unspoken diversity in Shazam, and what about Pike's backstory? <laughs> Hang on a second. I have a lot to say about that. I would love to have answered that question. Um, thank you for that, Fergal. And uh, Jim Boyer says, was it fun channeling your inner Lloyd Bridges in Vegas? Looks like I picked a bad week to stop drinking. Are you going to diet at Thanksgiving next? <laughs> well, no, here's the thing. You know, hey, man, my face looks better when I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get thinner and, and, and not drink anymore. Not, no, I love drinking. I love alcohol. If you, if you saw all of the Allagash, Tom from the Allagash, who's an Allagash uh, uh, beer representative from Southern California, sent me a bunch no, I'm not going to, I'm just going to start, you know, I'm trying to work out, lose, lose some weight, get down to my svelte self. I mean, I keep getting emails, emails from people going, wow, you know, you were so handsome when you were a kid. I'm like, oh man, I guess I'm really ugly now. <laughs> but no, it's just, if you want to get, look, here's how you want to, how you get back in shape, you exercise, you eat right, and you don't drink a lot of alcohol. And if you do drink alcohol, you drink like vodka and, and sugar-free soda. And I don't mean, I mean, soda water, <laughs> you know, that's it. That's all you can do. Um, but so Mark C, Mark C, uh, what did I think about the unspoken diversity in Shazam? I thought I actually loved it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I don't want to get into spoilers, but something happens in Shazam that I should have seen coming a mile away. I didn't, I was delighted by it. I thought, you know, they never really made a point. There's a big, you, we know that Billy Batson is a foster child and he gets taken in by a foster family with multiple kids. I really liked that part of the film. That was one of my favorite parts of the film. But the fact that there was diversity in it, it was never an issue. Nobody talked about color. No, uh, there was, there was, there was people talked about the handicapped, but I really enjoyed that a great deal. I especially enjoyed it uh, later in the film when something happens. I don't know why I didn't see that coming, but man, did I love it. 
uh, I love that part. Uh, it 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 was I I quite enjoyed it. I was not a big fan of Shazam on a whole though. I I, I thought to be to be honest, I thought it lacked verisimilitude. I thought I thought it wasn't as clever and it wasn't as well written as I hoped it would be. I was actually I have to say I was somewhat disappointed that the 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 scenes that that when Shazam was created and uh I just thought that they could have done more with it. I I was a little disappointed to be honest. Just plain Steve is here off topic, but I wasn't a fan of older movies until one sleepless night a few years ago and caught Irma La Deuce on TV. What a gem. Have you seen it? Any other classic non-sci-fi recommendations? Oh my god. Well, first of all, I got to keep my movie my movie list going. I'm only up to F. Just plain Steve. First of all, Steve, if you're not watching older movies, by God, get on it, son. You got to you got to do this. Some of the greatest movies in the world are movies that are what quote unquote old. Let me tell you about two movies that you have to see, and you 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 have to see these movies because they have two of the greatest screenplays ever written. Okay, you ready? Sunset Boulevard and All About Eve. They make a great double bill if you want it. Like, watch one in the morning, have some lunch, watch one in the afternoon. Uh, All About Eve even won Best Picture of 1950. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's set in the theater. Now, here, here's the thing. And and when you guys, here's here's how I would tell you to watch older films. If you're if you're not interested in like, ah, oh, I don't like older movies. The pacing is different. They're more theatrical. Yes, the pacing is different. They're more theatrical. What you should try and do, and if 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 you're interested, it's going to take a little research. Find out. Look a cursory glance at the IMDb will tell you when this movie was made and when it came out, right? Go, there's like the historical timelines or something. Just go to one of those. It's online. Just go, what happened in 1950? Because that's when All About Eve won Best Picture. So it came out in 49, right? So go and read just a cursory glance. What happened in 1949? Like what was going on? What was the number one song? What baseball team won the World Series? What wars are being fought around the world? Try and put yourself in the mindset, if only for five minutes, of what the world, what the United States was like when the movie came out. And 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 think about the fact that the movie, when it came out, was a reflection of the society that existed at that time. So not only is the movie a window into the world, but it's also it's also a window into your own culture. You, the the and and it's really interesting because. All about Eve to me is again one of the greatest screenplays ever written, but it's it's also about the theater. If you ever have thought anything about Broadway or the theater, really interesting film, and uh, uh, you will be rewarded. It also has one of the greatest femme fatales of all time. Sunset Boulevard is a great movie about about Hollywood. It's a great movie about aging. I mean, and if you think about when you're watching Sunset Boulevard, think about all the people, all the plastic surgery and the Botox and how how we now in the modern age are constantly fighting against aging and getting older and and how horrible it is when when um when entropy and time we suffer the ravages and our 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 bodies fail us and our careers don't wind up where they're supposed to wind up again sunset boulevard another great film noir well it's it is a film noir movie here I, i'll t- i'm going to give you a list of black and white films that are favorites of mine all about even Sunset Boulevard, Double Indemnity, okay, Billy Wilder's The Apartment with Jack Lemmon and Shirley MacLaine, and here's the John Frankenheimer trifecta from the mid '60s, Seven Days in May, which is about a military coup against the United States, internal military coup. Seconds, one of my favorite science fiction movies ever made, and um. The, the Manchurian Candidate. So Seven Days in May, Seconds and the Manchurian Candidate, all directed by John Frankenheimer. And I'm going to give you another movie with another one of the great the great screenplays of all time. The Sweet Smell of Success with Tony Curtis and Burt Lancaster. Just for today, since you asked, get those movies, watch them. And Irma LaDuce, what a great movie. Uh, uh, I haven't seen that movie in a long time, but I saw a revival of that at the Seattle uh, Film Festival one year, and terrific film. Now, if you want to watch, if you want to watch uh, some great 
foreign films. Uh, I'll have to come back to that because there's there's so many. But you've got to watch. Look, Kurosawa, everyone talks about The Seven Samurai, and everybody talks about Hidden Fortress because that's what Star Wars was based on. Watch, since this subject matter, we've talked about abuse and that kind of thing. Watch Rauschemann. Kurosawa's Rauschemann. If you haven't seen Rauschemann, you got to see Rauschemann. It's incredible. Doshi says, if your house caught on fire and you could take only one, by the way, none of those are sci-fi movies. Although Seconds is a sci-fi movie, but it's interesting. It's it's sci-fi obliquely sort of. Uh, if your house caught on fire and you could take only one item or Blu-ray, what would you save? Uh, the last, also the last video with you and John got heated. Did it get heated? <laughs> Did it? Um, what if I could take only one item on Blu-ray, what would you save? God, that's hard, man. I first of all, I'd cheat. I would take a, a box. You know what? I'd take the Kubrick box set. I'd cheat. I'd take the Kubrick box set so I'd have all of Kubrick's movies in one box. Uh, probably that because Stanley Kubrick's my favorite director. Even though I've seen all of those movies a million times, I'd probably take that. Um, uh, Will <laughs> Willow Yang says, "How many messages have you received for your fifteen thousand dollar Endgame tickets? I like imagining you in a trench coat outside a theater scalping tickets. Well, if I was uh, outside of a theater in a trench coat doing anything else, I'd be really suspect." Um, Keaton Toothman says, "Hey, brother, just want to say hi. Nobody has offered me fifteen thousand dollars for those. We on the John Campia show yesterday. We were talking about people that are scalping Endgame tickets, and I, my opinion was." Brother, if you can get 15 grand for your endgame tickets for opening night, more power to you. God love you. Uh, if I could get $60,000 for my four endgame tickets for the first show at the Cinerama Dome, I would give them up. <laughs> uh, I absolutely would. Um, so, Mark, uh, I hope I answered your question about the diversity in uh, Shazam. But, you know, I thought that was actually, to, to go back to that topic, I thought that was delightful. You know, one of the, the best things about Shazam was all the people that got to play those kids, the foster kids. I thought they were great. That little, the little black girl, and I forget her name, she was adorable. I loved her. I She was great. Um, she, You know, her line delivery, she was a great little actress. I mean, uh, what does she say? Can you keep a secret? Oh, mostly, or whatever what she said. I thought that was hilarious. She was great. I really loved all of the cast in Shazam. Uh, my problems with the movie. Uh Oh, wait, Mark C says it's too long for a regular chat. I'll DM you. Uh, DM me. I'll, 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 I'll read it now. Uh, Mugen08 says, RMB, thanks for recommending Rauschemann, my fave. Isn't it great? See, here's what I don't understand. I, I don't understand why film fans are not delving into the past. You know, I, once I started watching, I kind of had that, that same aversion when I was younger. And then once I started watching, older movies. I love the dialogue, the pitter patter, the way they're look, they're a lot more stage bound and the cameras don't move and there's not the effects. And, but the movies, especially about people, man, there's some doozies movies like a face in the crowd or like anatomy of a murder. You know, I, I watched a movie I'd heard about with Keir delay called bunny Lake is missing. And I watched that the other day. I bought it from twilight time on Blu-ray. I'd never seen it. Uh, what it was totally not what I thought. You know, and and going back and, and watching a lot of these movies, I mean, there's a lot of like I love what I would call '60s erotic Euro trash movies. <laughs> I, I'm a real fan. They're not pornographic. I mean, there's sex in them, but but they they like movies like Vampiros Lesbos, which is not what it sounds like, or or uh, Femina Ridens, the the laughing woman. That, that has a Stelvio Cipriani soundtrack, or there's a crazy movie by a guy who actually did end up uh, directing porno, but there's a film called The Licorice Quartet that's sort of this surrealistic movie. But, you know, it's funny. I mean, you, you, you'd you watch these movies that were made in the 60s, and they seem, a lot of people get angry. I mean, they're, they would be triggering to some people, I guess. But, I mean, I grew up watching all kinds of films, and, and there's some really interesting, great, great, great movies. I mean, look, if you like horror films, you know, watch Quatermass 2 from 1955. It's got a very uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers vibe to it. I mean, I love all that stuff. Uh, Victory Unlimited shows us people have become too soft and too sensitive. A reactionary life lived by incessantly practicing emotional defense and avoiding all potential sources of emotional offense is not living at all. Man, I totally agree with you. That is a great sentiment. I love that idea. 
Uh, Doshi says, I love these changes of paces. Doshi says, have you picked up Bumblebee on Blu-ray? Yes, I have. I've yet to watch it. I uh, actually picked up on 4-ray. Four, four. Oh, hang on. I'm going to go uh, Mark C. Can I not discuss it here, Mark? Since you sent it back to me, I'm going to go look right now. I'm going to go. I'm going to go find it. Yes, I am. I'm going to go find it. Um, I'm going to find what Mark C sent me. I'm going to go get it on. Oh, I probably have to look up. I have to. I have to log into my Twitter again um, to do that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I look. There is so much joy to be found in older movies. I mean, there really is. And I think if you guys aren't watching older films, that you're doing yourselves a disservice because look, yes. Is it, is it hard to get into the style of, of older films? Absolutely. And I think that a lot of people um, find that difficult because, you know, modern films, the quick cutting, the color, the effects, they're very different than older movies because technology has moved on and all that. But what I love about older movies is they're so literary. You know, there's, they're, they're, there's just so much joy in those films and um uh i i i love them so i think they're so great um oh okay here is wow i i, I didn't know that mark c i didn't know you've sent me some interesting stuff so <laughs> i've seen this before okay <clears throat> um this was Mark C's super chat that I guess I missed. So I'm going to read this Shazam for all the buster I give about my hatred for forced diversity and characters created just to fill a stereotype. This movie does it right. That foster family is practically a Benetton ad. Didn't notice because it was virtue signaled. They were just real characters serving a story, dude. Bravo. I totally agree with you. I think that is a, that is a fantastic observation. Again, because they're foster kids, the the multi ethnic mix up or, or mixture of these kids was fine. You know, you don't you're not paying attention to it because their race was not an issue. What was the issue was the foster kids, and I honestly loved that part of the movie. I uh, I, I thought it was great. I enjoyed it immensely. Um, so you're absolutely right. That is the way to do diversity in movies. It's just matter of fact, and I loved it. I thought it was. I thought it was terrific and delightful. And I really enjoyed when they came together as a family. It's really good. <laughs> I love that. Fergal Kelly says, watched Discovery and found it boring. Sorry to say, for the most part, apart from Pike's coming to terms with this future, uh, uh, coming to terms with this future about, about like the many outweigh, oh, the needs of the many, out, a bit like, I get it. Coming, coming to terms with his future a bit like the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Yes, I agree. Um, Aaron H. says, which moment in MCU history has shocked you the most? Mine was in Homecoming when Peter sees Vulture at the front door. Love that channel. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you for that, Aaron. Uh, what shocked me the most? I got to tell you, probably the Winter Soldier killing Stark's parents. I didn't see that coming. Uh, that was amazing. Um, amazing. But I want to get back to what Victory, uh, Victory Unlimited show said here about that people have become too soft and too incense or too sensitive. I totally agree with that. Like we live in this, people have forgotten. Like I often think we need a great war where people start seeing what what we our outrage culture. I think of it as a luxury. You, you if you're not looking for food, you're not foraging for food. You're not trying to survive from predators eating you. You're you're not you you already have a roof over your head. You already have money. You've, you're carrying around a supercomputer in your pocket. You're looking for things to give you meaning in your life. Like I take meaning in movies and making movies and you know my Ed two hundred nine Hot Toys figures and and you know the 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 Estes Estes model rockets. I'm still so fond of building. Which by the way, I love this. Uh, this is an Estes Interceptor C I built. This was my favorite rocket as a kid, but um, they actually built an upscale version. I had to have this. I built this. I love this rocket. I, I keep it close because I like to play with it like some people play with baseball bats, I guess. I, li I love my Interceptor E. I have another rocket that's above our fireplace out in the family room. I should bring it and show it because I can never get enough model rockets. But yeah, I think that, that outrage is a luxury. We're getting, we get mad at our fellow human beings and we're getting used to it. Uh, we think our outrage is somehow helpful. 
And to me, what's helpful is building. Whether you're building bridges between people, whether you're building bridges between your family, whether you're building anything, creating anything, the act of creation is inherently optimistic. And especially when you're creating something with other people, I really believe that that's important. And, you know, when you're out there screaming and yelling, what I watched, I, I keep thinking about what happened at the Evergreen State College. You had students who feel that they're they're so consumed with their own desire to, to their own. I mean, to me, campus outrage is, is some of the most selfish outrage because a campus is a place where ideas are supposed to flow freely. And when you start stifling ideas and stifling thought on college campuses, that's terrifying to me because I learned so much. I had my mind open so much when I was in college, listening to people of all walks of life talk. I love going to lectures. I would go to lectures at college of things I didn't even know about. Like I'm like, eh, I don't know much about that. It's not my subject, architecture, art. You know, I would just go audit lectures <laughs> sometimes for, just to see like, this sounds interesting. You know, I don't know anything about this, but I'll go, you know, there's some microbiologist who's going to come speak to the science department. If I can get in, I'd go listen to it. You know, if it sounded remotely interesting because that's how you learn, you know, and, 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 and it was funny because people have often talked that John Campy and I can disagree on the show and we don't get mad at each other, but I respect John's idea. I, I ideas I've learned from John. I've learned so much about YouTube from, from John. I mean, I have, and, and, and we don't, we're different kinds of people. We don't feel the same way. Um, it's, uh, it, it, yet we are, we don't yell and scream at each other. There's mutual respect. He'll bust my chops. It's fun. I mean, we're doing it for entertainment purposes as well, but we do have disagreements. He loved Shazam. I didn't. And I was explaining why I didn't love Shazam to him today and he didn't buy it, you know, but that's okay. Candy Van Man says, got my first hot toy, the Infinity War Thor. It's an expensive hobby. Dude, that figure is dope. How cool is it that he comes with the lightning? Uh, it's it, that figure is awesome and you can do a lot of different things with that figure i don't have that figure yet uh, I've, i'm still my avengers shelf is you can't really see it it's right there but uh you will be able to see it because again i think this weekend tomorrow i'm going to maybe shift everything around and change the background a bit more but you know what i'll miss seeing this eagle i put there the 148 scale eagle and my enterprise you'll still be able to see that and of course pearl over here the xenomorph i don't know if you'll see a lot of this stuff anymore but hey it'll change and uh It'll be interesting, but yes, it is an it is an expensive hobby. Uh, there's a lot of great people on YouTube that make videos of their hot toys collections, and I can't get enough of those videos. So I dig that. Just plain Steve is back and says, speaking of older films, before the glitz and the glamour of being a GM paint shop supervisor, I served many many years as a communication specialist in the army. Any older military movie recommendations? That's interesting. I mean, of course, milit I love movies, but I'll tell you a few movies. I don't know how authentic they are, but I was a stickler, stickler, a stickler. That's not the right word. I, 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 let's just say I was a great aficionado of World War II movies. I mean, I love movies like Where Eagles Dare. <laughs> you know, if you haven't seen that movie, Where Eagles Dare is great. Of course, you have to have seen, if you haven't seen Patton, 1970s Patton with George C. Scott as Patton, you got to see Patton. You know, stuff like The Longest Day. Um, Gilbert is doing something horrific. Gilbert is here. He's coming coming and going. I don't know what he just took out of the garbage can, which he loves to take out of the garbage can. I don't know. But, you know, military movies. Um, uh, by the way, thanks for your service. That's very cool that you were a communication specialist. My dad was in World War II. He was stationed actually in Alaska. He was also a communication specialist probably different from the job you did, but he actually met Douglas MacArthur once on an airplane, which I thought was the coolest thing ever. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> Brad Brickley says, proud of your weight loss resolve. I'm down 30, a hundred to go. Ha ha. Exercise, small portions, meals, seventh seal. Bo oh, <laughs> then you go into <laughs> small portions. Then you go into M the seventh seal, Bogart, Chaplin, Keaton, and Harold Lloyd are favorite black and whites. All good choices, sir. Uh, Alexander Wilson asks, what are your top three favorite things at CinemaCon? That's a really good question. Um, top, first of all, I loved the Terminator Dark Faith clips that I saw. I wasn't expecting those at all. I really liked the extended um, Rocket Man clip. 
course, the end game clip looked great. I I probably love seeing that the most, just because I'm so excited for end game. They show that whole scene; it was terrific. Um, what I again, what John and I were talking about on the show, what I really liked was that Paramount, Warner Brothers, Universal, and Disney and 20th Century Fox. They all well, not so much Disney because they're Disney is pretty much they're almost all franchise and spectacle now. There's not a lot of original movies at all coming out of Disney, which is fine with me. You know, they got Star Wars, they got Marvel, they got Pixar, they got Disney's proper animation. I'm all fine with that. But the other studios all have a pretty diverse slate of films coming out. And that I really liked seeing that. I wish at CinemaCon the other mini majors, such as like A24 is one of my favorite distributors. I love what A24 is putting out, although kind of bummed out they're dumping under the Silver Lake on VOD, which I understand, but it bums me out. Uh, Pleasant Valley Picker Canada says, Rob, another great foreign film. What are you, what are you doing, Gilbert? Come here. Come on. Come on, Gilbert. You want to come up? Come on. Come on. Come on, buddy. Come here. No, come here. Yeah, here you go. Come on up. Oh, look who's here, buddy. Here it is. Here's Gilbert, everybody. Say hello to the Gilbert, the Gilbertium from the planet Gilbar. How are you, buddy? You're a good boy? Huh? Yeah, you're a good boy, buddy. So he's, he's just chilling. He likes hanging out on Saturdays. He doesn't like it when I'm doing these chats because I'm not paying attention to him. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, Knights of uh, Ple Pleasant Valley Picker Canada says, Rob, another great foreign film is Fellini's Knights of Cabria, one of the greatest films ever. The ending is tragic and beautiful. Amazing. Pleasant Valley Picker Canada, you are correct. Uh, I'm a big Fellini fan. Knights of Cabria is great. Of course, uh, you know, everything from uh, Satyricon, uh, Eight and a Half, uh, you know, those are... You, if you guys haven't seen a Fellini movie, you really need to see a Fellini movie. Please do. And you've got to... You'll love it. You'll love Fellini movies. They're great. Uncle Remus says, I saw Apollo 11 in the theater this week. For those who don't know, the movie shows what America... Let me read that again. Uncle Remus says, I saw Apollo 11 in the theater this week. For those who don't know, the movie shows when America could come together and accomplish a goal that we all can be proud of. Excellent movie. I, I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to buy it. Uh, as everyone knows, this year, Ju July 20th, is the 50th anniversary of America landing on the moon. And yes, we did land on the moon. And, you know, there's a lot of people now. Uh, one of the things, uh, I, Christopher Nolan's Interstellar, I wasn't a big fan of because I'd read his brother's original script that Spielberg was going to direct, which was quite different, uh, that I really liked. But one of the things that, that was I found terrifying in that movie was history had gone on to the point where they said the moon landing was a myth and people no longer believe that we went to the moon. And that that just scared me to death because we did go to the moon. <laughs> you, you can see that we went to the moon. Um, so, yeah. Um. Jordan Miller says, have you checked out War of the Realms, Rob? The first issue was pretty good. Some wonky jokes, but overall, I enjoyed it. Excited for the rest of the series. I have not. I have not ch checked out War of the Realms. Um, I, I will check that out. Charlie Rogers says, I love you, Robert. It's been a blast getting to know you better, sir. Well, the blast has been all mine, Charlie. First of all, thanks. Thanks for that. I never thought this 85 chats. Um, I'm coming in on, on 100. I'm going to do something special for the 100th chat, you guys. Um, it's been terrific being here and meeting everybody. I've, I've really enjoyed all the interaction. And it's interesting. It is hilarious to me that since I've been doing these chats, I get sponsored by a company that I, I love. Let's once again, let me tout their product. Lucky Tiger, Suds and Studs. Now, this peppermint soap, I'm not kidding you. I love this peppermint soap. The only thing is they only sent me one bar. I got to like use this platform if they're going to sponsor me. I want some more of their free shit. I got to get them to send me more of these 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 um these bars of soap. You know, I've often thought that for my Patreon, we're going to start like I think I'm going to move. I might move my Patreon onto my website or something. And I was thinking like if people are going to, we're thinking about starting these things called the Burnett Box, where I'm going to make like for Patreons or membership subscribers, we're going to get products like products that I like, <laughs> put them in these boxes and send them to the patrons. Cause I think that'd be cool. Kind of like, you know how you get a loot, a loot crate, but I want to make a Burnett loot crate, by the way, I'm not trying to steal their trademark if loot crates trademarked. I don't know, but I think that it would be cool if I could get like Blu-rays and stuff that I like. I, no one's ever going to give me hot toys to give out. So hold your horses there kids. Cause <laughs> if anyone's going to send me that, I'm going to have to go through that stuff first, but I think it would be It'd be a lot of fun. But like when I got this, I have to tell you, and I haven't even gone through all the stuff they sent me, but man, 
suds and studs and there's a tiger on it which is great i, I you know i want to come up with that that meme when mary jane uh mary jane watson first meets spider-man you know the lucky <laughs> lucky business i i don't think i could do that i'd co-opt the marvel copyright with that and somebody would get pissed but i was trying to think of some way to work that in but it, it's been cool it's been cool meeting everybody and it's been cool interacting and how this community has grown i mean when i ask you guys to write alan murphy the ceo of lucky tiger at first i thought well i didn't think i just thought it would be kind of funny like here's a here's an asymmetric way of marketing <laughs> You know, if you want to, if you want to, I love their products, so I will tout their products because I like them <laughs> and they're great. And, um, I, you know, I didn't even know how much I would like them. So it's great to have people here that, that I enjoy and, and, uh, uh, have this community that, that other people are noticing and want to help out with, which I think is great because we should get bigger. We should take over the world, like pinky in the brain, the post geek singularity, um, Sterling Reviews is here. He says, favorite action movies are definitely the two Raid movies. Wasn't there supposed to be an American remake? Well, Sterling, let me tell you, sir, that you don't call the Raid the Raid here. You call it the Rad. And instead of the Raid 2 Barrendal, it's the Rad 2 even radder. Um, Sterling, you park your shuttlecraft in the same shuttle bay I park mine in because, man, do I love the Raid movies. For those of you who haven't seen the Indonesian martial arts extravaganza films, the Raid and the Raid 2 Barrendal. What are you waiting for? They're on Blu-ray. I think the Raid is on Netflix. I don't know if the Raid 2 is on Netflix. These movies are bonkers and in the very best way. You've got to watch them. I love them. And Sterling, yes, sir. I love those movies so much. Oh, my God. Um, Patrick Glanville says, reading regarding Norman's letter, I'm old enough to have seen Donner's Superman in the theater. Me too. I loved Zack Snyder's take, though. I agree with you. John Campion and I are always saying, I love Man of Steel. I love Superman the movie. I saw it at the John Dance Theater in Bellevue, Washington. It isn't there anymore, but I love it. Uh, it's great stuff. So I agree. I don't know why people don't like Man of Steel. I really don't. It, it boggles my mind. But I appreciate that they don't. Um, and Patrick Gl Glanville says, a rare, honest Shazam review. Most reviewers say it's fun, therefore it's good. Let me tell you what I didn't like about Shazam. Um, and John Campy disagreed with this entirely. So in the beginning of the movie, Billy Batson, the, this is, okay, if, if you guys, this is a spoiler. I'm going to say right now, I'm, I'm, it's not a big spoiler. I'm just going to spoil something uh, from early on in the movie. If you, if you haven't seen Shazam yet, you've been warned. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, in the film, Billy Batson is a, um, a, a he's a foster kid. And it's established that he's escaped from eight foster homes. And he's a detective. He's looking for his mother. And he's very smart about it. And at one point in the film, early on in the, in the movie, he, ac he actually dupes these cops and is showing up to a store that's presumably being robbed. He ends up locking them into the store long enough, and he also steals the lunch of one of the cops, long enough that he gets inside their squad car he uses the computer in their squad car to look up the address of other potential women with the last name of Batson that are his mother. This is shown as being a clever, he's a very clever, resourceful, streetwise kid. When he turns into Shazam in the movie, that is not a spoiler alert, you know he's going to turn into Shazam. He turns into a completely uncreative, in my mind, stupid kid. None of the intelligence that he showed us as Billy Batson is on display when he becomes Shazam. And John Campia was saying to me that, well, he, you know, he just turned into the superhero. He doesn't know what he's supposed to do. Yeah, but he's still shown as being a really smart, really resourceful kid. And the way Billy Batson's character is set up before he becomes Shazam is then no longer reflected after he becomes Shazam. He just does a bunch of stupid things. And I didn't like that. I didn't like that. I mean, literally, he's making lightning bolts on the street corner for money. I just thought that was really dumb. And um, anyway, spoiler alert's over. You can come back. Come back. Come back. My spoiler alert's over. Uh, Fenwar says, hello from New York. Well, hello, Fenwar. Jennifer Jones says, as much as I love Shazam, I agree with the becoming moment critique. That was one thing I brought up afterwards. But, man, it was a fun movie. No doubt it was a fun movie. Um. I, I just, I didn't, it was fun. I just didn't love it as much as I wanted. It was fine. You know what it felt like? 
I'll tell you what it felt like. I was one of the producers of Agent Cody Banks. Uh, my partners and I, my two partners and I actually purchased that script. We bought it. And then we had writers Zach Stentz and Ashley Miller rewrite it. They're two of my good friends. They rewrote Agent Cody Banks and they turned it into the script that we were able to sell to MGM. And the Agent Cody Banks script, when they rewrote it, basically it was Ferris Bueller meets James Bond. What if Ferris Bueller was a secret agent? And it was really directed at the 16 to 24 year old audience. And when the studio purchased the script, when it was what it means, what that means is it's out of our control. They decided to make it a tween movie for eight to 12 year olds. That's why Hilary Duff and Frankie Munez are in it. Now, I'm proud of the first Agent Cody Banks movie, but it was definitely dumbed down from what it was supposed to be. And I, my, I never want to dumb down anything for kids. I think kids are infantilized in our culture. I think they're a lot smarter than they're given credit for. And it seems to me, it seemed to me that Shazam was like Agent Cody Banks, that all of the knowing humor, the sophisticated elements of the story were taken away. And it was really a kid's movie. Uh, it was really, it, 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 it lacked an adult sophistication. And I think kids, the kids in the movie were, they were more sophisticated than that. I really, I really believe that they were. And um, I was a little disappointed by that. So uh, it bummed me out, to be honest. And I wanted it to be better. Victory Unlimited show, you are a very generous man, Victory, or, or woman, or gentle person, or maybe you're an AI. I don't know. Whatever you are, Victory Unlimited, you are a very generous person and a great supporter of this station, this channel. I want to thank you for your ongoing support. It's great. And you have great questions, which makes it even better. Um, Victory Unlimited show says, getting outraged over microaggressions is a self-inflicted first world problem. Amen. Political overcorrectness is really just forced submission with a smile. It is a societal construct that can only yield mixed results. Now they're mixed. I could not agree with you more. That is why the left terrifies me. Oh, I've got something I'm going to talk about. I wasn't going to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it now. Decorum Nation says, any regrets watching Endgame footage? None at all. It made me more, it, 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 first of all, it, it more questions arose in my mind. I'm like, where was Stark? It was a scene from clearly on early on in the movie. I it looked so good. I just loved seeing the the um, the uh, pitter patter. I I oh, Charlie Rogers has sent me a DM, which he says it's too long. I'm not guaranteeing I'm going to read it, Charlie. If I like it, I'll read it. Let me get there. Um, <laughs> Bach to the future says Burnett Box TM. There you go. Yeah, wouldn't it be cool? Like if I can get sponsorship for this and if I can increase the viewership and get more subscribers and all that, I could, you know, my Patreon subscribers, I'm, 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 which are great, but you know, it's, then I don't push Patreon necessarily, but, but if I had, I'm going to start, I think a membership tier, like you can become an imagination connoisseur for like a dollar a year. That's what I'm going to make like a buck a year. If you want to support this channel, become an imagination connoisseur subscriber for a dollar. Um, uh, cause that's what I'm gonna do. Cause I, I want to start sending stuff out and, and sharing because everybody's I, I get a lot of dms and messages like what should i watch what should i do this that and the other thing and i'm like uh, if there's a way like put something together that people could get that would be cool like as everyone knows my man cousin neil neil who's created the space rock he's not my real cousin he just his emails cousin neil um he's creating the space rob video game that i hope i'm gonna have a little bit to show in two weeks a little over two weeks uh actually a little less than two weeks for the 100th live Rob observations chat i hope to debut the Rob observations video game uh the adventure game you'll get to see that and also talk to alan murphy the ceo of lucky tiger and by the way keep writing him keep going to get get lucky tiger.com or club lucky tiger.com and write to alan murphy because <laughs> he's writing people back <laughs> which i think is hilarious by the way if you write to alan murphy and he does write you back um, I want you to 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 send me both the letter you sent him and then his response, and I'm going to read them. I'm going to start reading them aloud on these chats because that that's how I just think it's hilarious. Because he just started getting emails from people. He's like, "What am I getting emails from people for?" <laughs> it's great. And I said, "Hey, man, you sponsor this channel, you get more than you you bargained for. You send me a bar of soap, and I'll pontificate about it." <laughs> By the way, let me pontificate some more about this suds for studs. If you, if you, I don't even know how much this costs. I hope it's like not 25 bucks or something like that. 
but you know what? If it is, it's worth it. I will sign up and buy. I want to buy more because I only have one bar. <laughs> I'm going to write Alan Murphy a letter. Hey, dude, can you send me some more stud suds? <laughs> suds for studs? Because it's really good stuff. I don't even know if it's like multi-flavored. Like if it only comes in peppermint. I don't even know. I need to become I need to become a lucky tiger expert, I guess. Um, but man, Victory Unlimited, I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> getting outraged over microaggressions is self-inflicted and it's a first world problem. I don't understand, man. Like I've always said, you cannot expect the world to be the way you want it to be. You can't. The world is the way it is. You need to go out into the world. The world is indifferent to your suffering, just like the universe is. Um Crixus Maximus also approves of Victory Unlimited shows uh, <laughs> chat. Just forced submission with a smile. Brilliant. It is brilliant. Fenwar says, Robert, do you believe in the paranormal? Um, I, you know, I don't know how you define paranormal, but I will say this. I think that eventually if there is a paranormal, if there are, say, ghosts or psychics, I believe that <laughs> why, why not? I don't know enough. But all of those things will eventually be proved by science. I think the universe is a lot weirder and stranger than we know. I mean, if you think about it, we can't even see the full visible light spectrum. Like, what if there are aliens observing us right now that just exist in a different light spectrum that we can see? They might be standing right behind us like the angels and wings of desire. Uh, you never know. Plus, I want to believe. I'm like Fox Mulder. I want to believe in the paranormal because wouldn't that make the world a cooler place to live? I think it would. Um, I think it'd be much cooler. Uh, Murray Reich says, Speak, speaking of Agent Cody Banks, whatever happened to Frankie Munez's career? I don't know. You know, a lot of people, he had a huge career as a young man with Malcolm in the Middle, right? And then, you know, some people just want to do other things. You know, you make a lot of money on a show like that. I mean, he probably made literally tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. And um, I, uh, I, uh, I think that um, you, you just never know. Uh, uh, people want he maybe he'll come back to acting one day. You know, Fred Ward came back. Now he's directing. You know, you just you just really don't know. Uh, let's see where Charlie Rogers. Um, I'm looking for Charlie Rogers. I don't see. Oh wait, hang on. I don't see Charlie. Oh wait, Charlie. Char okay, I'm gonna read this. Uh, I'm gonna read what Charlie Rogers said. Hey, Robert, I just wanted to tell you how much I appreciate your YouTube chats. I've told you in the past that I'm a conservative, but I just wanted to let you know that although I am conservative, there are areas that I disagree with. I support love in any way you see fit. If you are gay, straight, bi, whatever, it is within your human right to love, love whomever you want. The government should not be involved in the aspect of that aspect of anyone's life. I'm a Christian, and I believe that God knows each of us, and such things are between you and your God alone. I'm also in favor of legalized marijuana because I have personally seen the health benefits. It is just like prohibition in my opinion, and it's just stupid. I just felt that I want you to know about me. Thank you for the respectful manner in which you handle yourself. Well, Charlie, can I just say thank you for that? I really appreciate, you know, Charlie just proved right here to me right just now with this tweet, and I hope to you, to you too as well, that people... You can disagree with people. You don't, like, I consider myself a progressive lefty, but the progressive left scares me more than any other part of the political spectrum now. Most of my friends who have conservative beliefs, I've enjoyed conservative thinkers in the past. I, I like reading conservative beliefs. I, I don't think that, like you just said, Charlie, if you're a conservative, it doesn't mean you hate LGBTQ issues. It does not mean that you are just adamantly against the world, it, it, or you're afraid of change or that you want to close the southern borders. I mean, conservatism is just what it says. It's you're conservative. You're, you believe in backing up what you're going to say with facts and figures and money, and you don't need to do profligate spending, and you don't necessarily well, – actually, I'm, I'm not – I am not – I am not couching the conservative agenda in, in a proper manner. But I believe that I have a lot of great conservative friends and I think what you just said is right. And it's interesting. People forget that. People forget that, uh, you know, if you are a Christian or you're Jewish or you're Muslim or you're Hindu or you're a Sikh or whatever you believe, that's between you and, and, and your God or your deity or whatever you believe in. There's no reason why you need to be pillared. I mean, Again, I believe in the sovereignty of the individual. I believe in individuals' individuals' rights. I think the West, 
that has been our strongest suit. Um, that 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 an individual and the rights of the individual are of paramount importance. And I'm not a fan of identity politics, even though all politics is identity politics. Group think scares me. I like getting together with people to have a healthy debate of all walks of life. And I have found, I have found that people who are usually pretty smart and enlightened are the same kind of people, whether they're devout Christians or whether they believe in legalization of marijuana or LGBTQ issues. A anybody that's thoughtful and intelligent. Uh, usually I find that I can have a conversation with. And I think it's good. I like talking to people whose views I might not necessarily agree with, but if we can have a, a good conversation, uh, I think that's a good thing. I mean, a lot of people, uh, like the Bill Maher show, I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of Bill Maher all the time, but I do like the fact that he has a show where people, he tries to get more conservative and more right-wing thinkers and people to come on his show, but at least it's a show, sure, it's run by Bill Maher's agenda. I have no illusions about that, but I just like watching a show where people are exchanging ideas. And like I've talked about on this show, I've become a fan of what, what is being called the intellectual dark web where there are a lot of people that were once progressive that have left and have become more centrist, but shows... You know, whether it's Joe Rogan, who I like, who gets, he's mostly, you know, he's more of a libertarian or a, a left-wing Democrat or, or you know, I enjoy those kinds of, uh, of shows. Dave Rubin. A lot of people give me shit for like, why do you say you like Dave Rubin? I like watching the people that he brings on his show talk. You know, I just like listening to people talk. Like, am I a big fan of Ben Shapiro or Jordan Peterson? No, but I do listen to them talk because I find their ideas compelling at least for me to uh, uh, to listen to and it's it's interesting it's, what's disappointed me is the reaction that i've seen to some of these people on the left and and i think we've got to start listening to each other more and more there's no reason to get angry and mad because we're all on the same planet we're all in this spinning ball of rock uh together and and we're all i think at our at our baseline we all believe in truth justice the american way you know it's just a question of how we're going to get to those things and um I think it's it's really important. So Charlie, thank you very much for writing that in. I think it's I think it's terrific. And and here, here, the post geek singularity, what draws us all, at least to this channel, is the love of the imagination, the love of science fiction, fantasy, horror, whether it's a novel form, movie form, television form, comic book form, role playing game form, whatever it is you guys like. It doesn't matter what your political backgrounds are, although it is interesting because depending on your politics, you play Dungeons and Dragons differently or you play risk differently. And I think that's cool because that makes you more of a formidable op opponent. I don't want to live in a world where people who just parrot back to me what I believe or what I think, I don't want to live in that world. I mean, I've read all the things that I've watched throughout my life. I've always challenged my beliefs. That's what makes life worth living. Man, I don't get it when, look, I don't like assholes. And there's assholes all over the place. I don't like people who squelch thought. I don't like people that try and tell me what to do and what to say and what to think. I like the people that bring something to the conversation that add to the tapestry of, of the world, you know, and, and, and let's rather than tear things down, let's make things. And I think making things can be making ideas, write something, go on Tumblr, start a Tumblr, write your own. I mean, I was going to try Tumblr, but it's easier to talk on the, on the internet, <laughs> but that's, that's what I think is uh, important. I think it's important. So I agree with you. And I really appreciate the fact that you feel Charlie, that you can come here and, and, and not be alienated by, by what I'm saying. Look, I can alienate some people. I'm sure I do. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's a lot of people like, Oh, poor Rob, he made one movie. And now he's wound up talking on the internet, but Hey, I was working on a feature film yesterday. So it's, it all, it all feeds into the same thing, but uh, I really appreciate that. Um, Crixus Maximus says they don't need to remake the raid, the rads, <laughs> the rads, <laughs> the originals are more than good enough. Remaking them will ruin them. I agree. First of all, I don't think you could, it's not like infernal affairs when Scorsese can turn it into the departed. I don't think you could make the raid in America. I don't even know if you could get insurance. Uh, I don't know. Terry Flynn says Twitter interactions with Rob are fun. Terry, I wrote you a filthy tweet that I was on the verge of sending. And I'm like, you know what? I don't think it was about manscaping. It was about manscaping. I'll tell you right, right away. It was a tweet about manscaping and, and shaving both the front and the back and being ready to rock and roll no matter what happens. 
and it's always better to be prepared. So, and I also was making a, a reference to a freshly shorn squo- scrot. And I can say that to you live now, but if I put it on Twitter, you know, somebody would have retweeted it and got the wrong idea. So there you go. But Terry interacting with you on Twitter is very fun too. And you send things that just, uh, I really want to write something really dirty back, but then I'd get in trouble or something. Uh, Uncle Remus says, anyone see the new Pet Cemetery? I'm dying to see it. I'm going to go see it probably tomorrow. Maybe I'll go tonight. That's actually a really good idea. Um, uh, Pleasant Valley Picker, Cal- uh, Canada. <laughs> see, I still want to say California. Pleasant, Pleasant Valley Picker, Cal- Canada says, Rob, it was nice that you used the lip balm on camera. Please do not feel the need to demonstrate the bath soap. <laughs> laugh out loud sorry rob i kid with affection man (laughs) look you know what i would use this i'm gonna actually it's really funny they don't i don't know if i can even do this but i want to make i've got a lot of video equipment i want to make a lucky tiger commercial (laughs) like once i get on the wirecast and start these chats i'm gonna put a lot more graphics and like i want to intercut funny things i want to make if anyone's going to sponsor me like i was talking to cody miller today about he has big sponsorships because he's an olympic gold medalist and he was telling me about getting sponsorships for youtube and what he has to do and he was telling me all these things and i was like saying i'm thinking i want to make a lucky tiger commercial of me like lathering up and stuff i don't know if i can do that like i don't believe in the ask for permission i believe in you beg for forgiveness after you've already done it um but then again i'd be giving away my resources and but i still think it'd be funny because i really i really do love this face I love this Lucky Tiger face wash. I really do. You know, because I've always loved face washes with the granular stuff in it. This is creamy without uh, having too much granular stuff, but it's got enough in it. I really like it. I just like it. It's good. And it, it what's great about this, this pepper, this soap is pepperminty. Ooh, it's good stuff. Um, but the the moisturizer in the face wash has just a light citrusy scent to it. So it's not some weird, overpowering, cheap ass cologne smell like. You know, like how Hannibal Lecter described Old Spice. It's got it's got a ship on a bottle, does it not? You know, whatever he said. But this is not like that. This is this is this is good stuff, and I really I, I quite enjoy it. Um, Brandon v- Valenzuela says, I don't think I read Brandon Valenzuela's uh, uh, super chat. He says, good point. He went from a somewhat mature t- teenager to a kid in the body of Shazam. Ah, uh, yes, he did. Brandon, and that's what you know. John made the the point to me. He said he disagreed with what I said about Shazam. That um, that because you know he was a superhero. He'd never been a superhero. He's a strapping young man now. And he's he is so powerful. I'm like, yeah, but that wouldn't suddenly make him dumb. You know, like oh my god, dude. It, it, the character of Billy Batson as portrayed in the movie really reverted, changed when he turned into Shazam. I wanted to see the kid Shazam still be shazam like i thought big handled that transformation in a much more unique way and again it just didn't have the verisimilitude i wanted um aaron johnson says hey rob what are your thoughts on the mighty ducks movies with emilio estevez there are a lot there are a lot of fun moments in all of the mighty ducks movies i think our culture has respect for sports and cinema look i'm not the biggest sports fan in the world but i love sports movies i have since i was a kid slap shot the original, The Longest Yard, uh, one of my favorite football movies. If you guys haven't seen North Dallas 40 with Nick Nolte and like Mac Davis, and I love that movie. I wasn't even a big football fan growing up, but I love movies about football. I love Any Given Sunday, Oliver Stone's Any Given Sunday. I love The Natural. I love the Mighty Ducks movies. I love the original Bad News Bears. You know, I, I there's something about sports movies. They're like cop movies. They inherently have these obstacles to overcome, you know, and and you're rooting for the cops usually. Uh, uh, But I love sports movies. I can't wait to get Field of Dreams isn't really. It's about baseball. It's about the essence of baseball, but it's not really about baseball itself. But I love it. It's coming out in 4K. Can't wait to get that. Dr. Emilio Lazardo says Shazam is better than Ragnarok. Can't go with you there. I liked Ragnarok a lot more than I like Shazam. Um. Um, Uncle Remus says, Rob, Star Trek Discovery is going for the Borg origin with this control storyline. If so, kind of lame. So lame. If they if they're if they're gonna tie that in, oh, I I can't if that's the case, uh, they're they're so creatively bankrupt over there. All they're doing is is pillaging other Star Trek shows. Uh, Discovery has not they first pillaged Brian Fuller's original story outlines, 
and now they're pillaging old Star Trek shows, and it's ridiculous. It's it's ridiculous. Oh, Doshi says I missed his super chats. Did I? Did I miss your super chats, Doshi? I I, I apologize. Oh. Doshi says, yesterday, John Campia got a $99 super chat. That's crazy. Well, you know, it's interesting. I've had people, to be honest, I've had people support this channel by sending me serious amounts of money uh, via PayPal and via other things. And, and that's, um, that's always appreciated. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll show you. I'll show you what I'm, what I'm working on. Now, because of the super chats, I'm going to show you this. I got this. Uh, this is a, I'll show you, this is like a mini, I got this as a mini control board to work what's called Wirecast, which is what John broadcasts from. And this is basically a television studio. It's a switcher that's going to allow me to, to do these, um, chats and add graphics and interactive material, kind of like John shows, but the people that have supported this channel, um, including my good friend, Mike Bodden, uh, are helping me do that. So what I'm going to be doing is really upping the game of these chats. So the same with John. I mean, John has a lot of equipment. He's always upgrading his mics. He's always, so it's, it's how we keep this stuff going, you know, is through super chats and through the kind of support Patreon. Otherwise, you know, why do it? It's great. So though that kind of support's amazing. And I've, I, the supports I get, the support I get from you guys on a daily basis is great, but I am, I'm constantly trying to upgrade. I need to get more lights I'd like to, you know, I want to put some pipe and drape behind my action figure thing. So I want to build, unfortunately, I need a new house, which I'll never be able to afford in Los Angeles because I'm basically in the laundry room. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. Uh, but yes, back to Mighty Ducks. I like Mighty Ducks. I, I what's, uh, the, my, what's not to love about the Mighty Ducks? Um, Brian Eng says, Lucky Tiger's getting their money's worth. <laughs> well, it's funny. I, I think so, but, the, but it's, for me, it's just fun to have a sponsor. Like for me, they sent me this big box and inside had three other boxes of all this stuff in it, like all the Lucky Tiger product lines. <laughs> so I just thought, it, like, why not have fun with it? If they're going to support me, uh, why I'm going to support them. And what's really cool is their Club Lucky Tiger concept where they're, they're, I mean, they're just really a men's grooming product place, but they want to turn their website Club Lucky Tiger into a, a place where new original content's being created for the web. And they're going to interview different bloggers. I'm going to start a, uh, doing podcasts and vlogs with people I don't know so I can talk to vloggers about men's issues and things that are going to go up there. So that's cool for me where I get to create more content because I just like making stuff. Whether I'm making a feature film, I mean, you don't get to, how often do you get to make feature films? Not often. Uh, unless you have great commercial success. I mean, I have to tell you, I'm going to go back. Let me talk about this. This is totally unrelated to what I want to talk about, but I'm going to talk about them anyway. So yesterday, I think it was yesterday, there was an article that dropped on the rap about the movie Heathers. And Heathers, the 1989 Michael Lehman film that was written by Daniel Waters, who later went on to write Hudson Hawk, a movie I have a lot of affection for that not a lot of other people do. But, um, so this, this guy, is like, he admits to being 24 years old and that him and his friends watched Heathers. And they talked about how, he talks about how offended they were by the movie, how it makes jokes about school shooting and homophobia and all this. And, and uh, I was aware of this article because Daniel Waters, who is a Facebook friend of mine who wrote the film, posted he likes when, because they've turned Heathers into a stage play, they did a new TV series recently. He writes that when people write about his work, He's always tickled, but sometimes even when people hate his work, he still finds their articles amusing. And he had posted this article from The Wrap, and i that's how I read it. And this was just yesterday. And I read this article. It, it completely missed the boat, but it also points to my great fear is that this kid who watched Heathers was offended by the movie so much and completely missed the boat, doesn't understand what dark satire is, and I'm just offended by it. A movie that was made, but, but you know, literally 30 years ago and i'm thinking well what if you watch clockwork orange you know the, the the problem and this speaks to what victory said earlier this the generation now that's getting so angered quick to anger about these things are not living in the real world and when real tragedy comes down the pike if civilization falls apart like it is and even in, in 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 south america in places now it's going crazy out there wait till the thin veneer of society is stripped away and you'll be longing for the days where people stopped at red lights, but it, it was really scary. 
So I was reading this article and it was really, it was making me incense this article. Um, I'm not going to even read it, but you can find it on the wrap. It's about Heather's and Daniel Waters uh, wrote about it. So check this out. This is why I love living in LA. So last night I went to see Shazam at the Cinerama Dome in Hollywood. I'm walking out and I run into this guy, David Avalone and Daniel Waters, the writer of Heather's who I had read, who read about this article about Heather's yesterday. I ran into him. And uh, we shook hands, and I said, Daniel, man, that was a rad post you did on on this article on The Wrap. And uh, he was angry. I mean, not angry, but he, he was just shaking his head going, man, some 24-year-old felt offended by Heathers and didn't enjoy it. I pity that guy. You know, and, and it's true. I mean, to not, to not enjoy Heathers, to not understand, it's, it's not saying those things are good. You know, that's what black comedies are. Um, Carlos Herrera is here. He says, check out the Spanish... Durante La Tormenta on Netflix. I think it's a great time. Tra- it's a time travel movie. Well written and fun. Found a few plot holes. Durante La Tormenta. I love that. Okay. That's a Spanish title. If you guys haven't seen another Spanish time travel movie called Time Crimes. Oh, you got to see Time Crimes. It's great. And it's really, it starts out with a guy hanging out in his backyard. That's all I'm going to say. Watch Time Crimes. Find out. I'd heard that Tom Cruise was once attached to a time crime remake, but it never happened. And uh, I would love to see it happen because that would be great. Olenti says, awesome to see how the chats help your show. Love it. Yes. I mean, you know, it keeps everybody going and um, um, it just helps you upgrade. You haven't seen too much evidence of that yet, but you will. and that's what the super chats are for. It's great. I mean, it's it's uh, it subsidizes everything. So uh, I really do appreciate that support. I'm I'm actually really touched by it. I mean, I got I got a guy has sent me a couple really really generous uh, super chats directly to my PayPal account, and you know I I wrote him back. I didn't hear back from. I wrote him back, but he never wrote me back. Back. <laughs> he doesn't have to, but it was it was very nice to get that kind of support from people. It's it's very cool. Uncle Remus says Star Trek Discovery rant. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I feel I feel here I am preaching tolerance, and I'm just like, you know, I rant about Star Trek Discovery. I'm I, am I just as bad? Hello, Gilbert. I don't think Gilbert's a big Discovery fan either. But I feel bad. I I, I rant about Star Trek Discovery, but I mean, come on. Come on. Uh Captain Robert April says, there is a major league thunderstorm going on to the north of me. <laughs> Are you in Florida? Weren't you in Florida? I love thunderstorms. Uh, Fenwar says, have people organize meetups in their own town and perhaps you can broadcast it from where you are. You know, that's a good idea too. But I have to tell you, this idea of Observation Nation, where I, I need to get like a car company to sponsor me so they can give me a car where out of the back, I can literally set up a mini studio, like get an SUV or something and set up a mini studio. And I literally want to travel the highways and byways of the land like Billy Batson and his mentor if you watch the old Shazam show from the 70s on DC Universe um but I think it'd be fun like I I I was obsessed for a while for doing about doing this documentary about 7-Eleven I really wanted to do this I have all the research and it'd it'd be great um but I I didn't pursue it I wanted to talk to the 7-Eleven head office and didn't do it I still want to do it um but uh I was going to travel around and go to all the 7-Elevens in the lower 48 and then go to 7-Elevens around the world. That's what I wanted to do. And I was going to crowdfund it. And there's a, I have a whole, there's a whole history behind it and everything. It'd be, it'd be cool. But I think it'd be really interesting uh, to um, uh, to do that, to drive around the country. And like, what I'm really hoping to do is I, I'm going to try and acquire the negative to uh, Free Enterprise or talk to uh, Mark Oswald, who owns Free Enterprise, and I want to do a 4K restoration of it and do actually a new cut of the film and maybe do what Kevin Smith did, have a new cut of Free Enterprise, my the one film I directed, to show for its 20th anniversary and just drive around the country and rent out theaters and and do ch- live chats that we can broadcast live and and then show Free Enterprise as well. Do a whole sort of, sort of a, um, uh, you know, like a, uh, I don't know what we call it, but Observation Nation was a f- thing a friend of mine threw out at WonderCon. Ashley Miller actually did, a uh, writer of Thor and X-Men First Class and the never-now-to-be-made uh, Red Sonja movie. Although it, maybe it will be made. I don't know. I don't know much about what's happening with it now. 
Mark C says, Field of Dreams is the only movie a man is allowed to cry in. I don't care what Campy says. Damn right. I cry. As, as, as Every time Kevin Costner says, Dad, want to have a catch? Come on. Tears, man. Tears streaming down my face. You can't not cry at Field of Dreams. Victory Unlimited says, back again, says, Alfred Hitchcock remade his own movie, The Man Who Do Too Much, and it's even better than the original. Has anybody else done this? That's interesting. Um, there's a few movies that have made, like, there's foreign directors, like um, uh, Funny Games, the director of Funny Games. Um, and why am I drawing a blank on his name? He's an incredible director. Hang on, I'll tell you. The director of Funny Games, and it's a movie that Mark Kermode hates. Uh, he hates Funny Games. Uh, why am I not? Let's see. So Funny Games was directed by, yes, Michael Haneke. Uh, he directed it. He remade his own movie in English. Uh, the original movie, um, it was, uh, it's Austrian. It's German-Austrian. And uh, he remade it in English. So I don't know if that counts. I mean, it's kind of the same thing. It's just different language. It's not exactly the same. But that's what first came to my mind. Um, Magic K says, I kind of want Freddie Freeman dresses... I kind of want Freddie Freeman dresses like Elvis in the sequel. I don't know what you wait. Hang on. What did you say first? Um, uh, Doshi says still missing two super chats. I sent a while ago. Did you? I <laughs> will go look. I think I've moved down this uh, last, this chat too much. I'll have to go back and look. I, you know what? I'm doing these live chats and I can't get, cause I'm on the new beta testing. I don't know what, but the, I, 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 I'm sorry, Doshi. Just tell me what they are. And I'll, I'll, I'll email them or, Send them, and I'll I'll read them. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Rob's or Vay Nation, Rob's or Nation, Vay Nation. I like Rob's Vay Nation. It's kind of it's kind of catchy. Um, uh, let's see. Uncle Remus says, Rob, check out Adam the Woo on YouTube. He has traveled all over the U.S. and has a long running vlog about his travels. You should try and do the same. I would love to do the same. As soon as as soon as um, uh, Tango Shalom is done, I wouldn't mind doing that. You know, save up some super chats and then go travel the United States. I think it'd be really, uh, really interesting. Uh, I think it would be fun to see. Um, wait, damn it. Newer chats getting answered and missing mine, Doshi. I apologize because you always send me chats and I apologize. I love you, Doshi. I'm sorry. I I'm, I'm bad with that. I'm bad with the whole super chat thing because I jump around. Uh, I shouldn't jump around. I'm kind of like, uh, you know, I'm always jumping around. Uh, Pleasant Valley Picker Canada says, I remember when Bill Maher dissed the 2010 Vancouver Olympics as Cirque du Soleil. Lost a lot of respect from Olympics were damn good. They were damn good, and he should not have said that. By the way, speaking of Olympics in Vancouver, all right, there's a series of books that are written by, it used to be a, tri a, tri a tri triumvirate, three Vancouver uh, criminal defense attorneys. And they've been writing these books since the mid '80s, and they write under the pen name Michael Slade, and they are Canadian. Uh, they're they're basically about the the Special X Division of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which, by the way, doesn't exist. It's it's fictitious, but these are these are awesome diabolical serial killer books. And this, this, they're they're uh, about two different characters, Zinc Chandler and Robert De Klerk, and, and and they tie in these really diabolical, nasty serial killers into Canadian history. And um, I think it's Jay Clark is the only one that's still writing the books, still writing the books. He did a great a great book about the Olympics called Red Snow. He did one of these books. It was part of his the Special X series. But if you guys like diabolical serial killer novels i highly recommend especially the first four books in this series the first book is headhunter the second book is ghoul and then cutthroat and ripper <laughs> now now what's really cool about what uh jay clark did is that well, i guess it was last year it might have been 2017 but i think it was 2018 he took the first special X book that was written in 84 headhunter and he reimagined it made it updated for today's technology because you know 35 years ago they didn't have they didn't have cell phones and stuff so so you read these books now and it, it's they're they were really outdated but they've been they he's been up updating them and 
I, I man, I loved Headhunter. I especially loved Ghoul. These books were diabolical. They had great twist endings. And uh, I've read on Facebook because I followed uh, Michael Slade on Facebook that they're reading another. They're, he's writing a new, a fi- the 15th special X thriller. And I mean, they're great. I love these books. Doshi says, oh, I'm sorry, Doshi. I just want to say thank you. Thanks to you, I'm starting my own YouTube channel, Talking Movies and Blu-ray Hunting. The channel name is Doshi. Well, everyone, Doshi is starting his own YouTube channel. Uh, Doshi is a longtime member of the post-geek singularity community. I think that's awesome. I think that YouTube is a way that you can talk to the world, and I will subscribe to your YouTube channel, sir. I will send your super chats back at you. How fun would that be? Um, Doc Seville says, Rob's super studio actually occupies a neighboring dimension. Man, wouldn't that be cool? Um, let's see. Aaron Johnson said a free enterprise tour would be awesome, especially if you can get the permission for a familiar theater chains like Regal Landmark and AMC to show free enterprise. That'd be great. I mean, I, I probably could, or you maybe have to do it with fathom. I don't know. Doshi says, can't remember what he sent. I'm sorry, Doshi. I'm sorry, Mr. Chats. Uh, Thanos for infinity says entertained. I say yes, Brie. It's in her ideology and how un- unlikable she is to a lot of people. I, you know, it's so weird to me that people. I, I've seen Brie Larson on 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 chats on on night night. Uh, why am I drawing a blank? You know, late night TV. I think she's delightful. Uh, I don't know why people. You know, she wanted to get more more. Look, it's not. It's no secret that old white dudes like myself are 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 make up the majority of movie punditry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mark C says thoughts on the Patrick Swayze Scott Bayo classic Skate Town USA. I think I saw that on Showtime in like 1981 or something. Or I don't I did see it but I don't remember. Uh you know, I remember gleaming the cube more uh roller boogie all those things. Those were back in the day. By the way, I'll tell you so I I'm really proud of this. Um I did get look at this. This is one of those shirts that pops up on Facebook. I I bought this shirt because I'm going to wear it to Infinity War. Now it's not the clever shirt anymore, but, or it's not the clever shirt in the world. But I did love it. So, come on, Goose wants Thanos because he's a flurkin, and I think Goose could take Thanos on. I saw that. I was like, I gotta, I gotta buy that shit. You know, it's one of those cheap T-shirts. I know it's not licensed. It's a bootleg shirt, but you know, so is this. So is this. So is this fantastic Planet shirt with Tiva. Um. But yeah, Skate Town USA, if you guys haven't seen it. Oh my God. Guys, girls, gentle beings, non-binary people, aliens, spirits, whoever is watching this channel. We've been going for a long time. This has been a good chat. I'm glad to be talking to all of you. I will be back tomorrow. I have to stop. I've got I got I have things I have to do. Um, mainly I've got to do laundry and put everything away from Vegas and uh, put my camera equipment together and all that. But um, this has been a great chat, you guys. It's great to have you here. A lot of people are here today. Please subscribe to the channel if you like this. Tell me, send me more ideas about what you want to see. Uh, I love your letters. Keep them coming to theburnetwork.net. The letters are absolutely incredible. Yeah, it's time to leave because Gilbert just brought something in from outside that he's tearing apart on my bed. Um, and it's great. And uh, hopefully, the, the again, the 100th episode of Rob Observations live chats are coming up. And uh, I really love interacting with you guys. It's been so interesting and and uh, fascinating. I, I let's just make it. Let's just keep it growing, man. And I want to thank Lucky Tiger for sponsoring this. I especially want to thank Lucky Tiger for creating this suds and studs. I love this so much. Now again, uh, getluckytiger.com. I'm gonna go check it out because I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go send another email to Alan Murphy myself. Maybe Alan Murphy will just send me a box of suds and studs i just want to get this stuff this peppermint soap it's so good basically i want to have it just open up the container so the entire bathroom smells of it like whenever i it's the greatest stuff ever ever but anyway i want to thank you all for being here thank you for participating thanks for the generous support of the channel i very much appreciate it and uh it's really great the community is growing and there's new people here all the time and uh it's it's just terrific and keep sending in those letters man um willow actually tomorrow willow yang watched star trek discovery she watched the first season of star trek discovery she had not seen it and she's not a star trek fan but she wrote me a really long letter about star trek discovery so tune in tomorrow because willow yang is going to tell you 
as a as a newbie, as a Star Trek noob. She's going to tell you a molecular biologist who's getting her PhD is going to tell you what she thought of the first season of Star Trek Discovery. And it's a humdinger. Uh, really interesting letter, obviously, because it came from Willow. Fantastically well written. And uh, I can't wait to share it with you. And by then, I will have watched this week's episode of Star Trek Discovery, which I am sure uh, I will have a lot to talk about. <laughs> but anyway, as I always say, Every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. All you have to do is listen. And with that, I bid you good evening. Uh, this was a great chat today, you guys, girls, everybody. Thank you for being here. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow. I'll try and be back tomorrow at noon. Let's make it noon. So uh, the people from Europe that weren't here, like Vesna from Bosnia, she's not here. It's like not a chat without Vesna. And, uh, you know, uh, she'll be back tomorrow if I'm here at noon. So thanks a lot. Everybody should go see Shazam this weekend. I had a blast watching it. I'm going to go see Pet Cemetery. I hope I'm going to have a blast watching that. So thank you all for being here. I will see you tomorrow at noon. Fire in those questions to the burnettwork.net. Tell me your stories. And also, I'm going to start the Imagination Connoisseur Gallery on the burnettwork.net. People are sending me some incredible photos of their collections of stuff. And uh, it's great. So I'm going to start putting those up. And uh, you'll like it. You'll all, I hope you'll like it. Anyway, have a good night. And what I also like to say is, as always, have a better day. <laughs>